Very good. Thank you, Chad. Oh, well. And, uh, and as Sean said, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it was certainly uh, a privilege to be here and get to listen to all of the stuff yesterday and, and address the folks today. And uh, I'm going to take the other half of this and talk about CWD from a free range and deer perspective. But we're going to do come at this from, uh, from a hunter's angle. And really, what are the implications to hunters? Because of all the things that we know that CWD impact, if you take a look here, you know, we essentially shoot all of these things or hunt them somewhere across the range. If we take a look at really what drives our wildlife management programs, um, it's hunting. And you can take a look at the, the hunting industry is an $87 billion industry. And, uh, and deer hunters are responsible for about half of that. So anything that's impacting free ranging deer, whether it's CWD, TB, or anything else, directly impacts deer hunters. And it has a direct impact to all of the other wildlife programs in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and every single other state. So uh, is it a big deal? It absolutely is a big deal. I do not see this at all as a captive deer issue or just a wild deer issue. It's an issue that impacts deer. Therefore, it impacts hunters and therefore it impacts all of our wildlife resources. So are there others that are there can also be impacted? There probably are. There's probably some other things that we don't know yet, but certainly the ones that are listed on there that it does impact have tremendous ramifications on our wildlife management system um, and all of our state wildlife agencies as they manage deer, non-game songbirds and everything else. So let's start with uh, some quick review of what we heard this yesterday. The important things to know from a hunting end and from a free ranging deer end is that there, there's no cure for this, there's no vaccine for this, and essentially we don't have a good practical live animal test that we can use to, to help minimize spread of this disease across captive facilities as well as across some of the interstate movement that, that wildlife agencies do. And uh, we had a question yesterday uh, to Dr. Nichols about, you know, the, the benefit of a live animal test. I'm here to say, you know, I would be a huge fan of a live animal test. And I see tremendous impacts for free ranging whitetails. If we knew anything that's moved captive was if we had a better system of understanding whether this animal has a disease or not um, and could stop any movement of animals that may have it unknowingly, as we saw the picture this morning, all these animals that do have it can have it for several months or even years without showing any signs, but simply be shedding those prions and infecting other animals from them. If we could stop that, that'd be a huge boom for everybody. Uh, the captive industry and certainly the uh, free ranging deer and, uh, and our hunters. So, with respect to white tailed deer, we know that the probability of infection increases with age in both bucks and does. We saw some graphs uh, yesterday and today, and, and I'll show some more of this. Specifically, from a hunting end, we know that adult bucks are, are more likely than adult does to be impacted, somewhere in the order of two to four times, which certainly has big issues when we start talking with hunters and our state wildlife agencies with regard to, all right, how are we going to manage this deer herd? We can take all the science that, that we know and things that we learn, and I'm sure you saw after yesterday and what we saw this morning, you know, there's certainly a lot that we know about CWD, but there's a tremendous amount that we don't know. So it's a matter of taking the best information we have within a management system and be able to apply it to a specific area. You know, one, I think one of the cool things about white tailed deer management is it's not a one-size-fits-all recipe. How we do it in Pennsylvania may differ from how you do it in Michigan or how they do it in Georgia. You take the deer herd that you have, you take your hunting culture, you take the environment that it's in, put that all together and come up with what works best. And I think that's exciting. You know, if it wasn't like that, who would want to be a deer manager? It'd be boring. Nobody would want to do that. So I think that, that you have an opportunity to take what will work best in your situation for this. The science plays a huge role in this, which your deer hunters play an equally big role because the, the DNR here can come up with the absolute best CWD management plan in the world. And if it's not supported by hunters and hunters aren't implementing it, then it's going to fail. And I think that's one of the big challenges that the working panel has is to sift through all of this and figure out how to be able to use hunters as the best advocates for the plan that the DNR puts together. Now, you're in a very good situation here because there are very few states that have the luxury of the good working relationship between the DNR and the majority of the deer hunters. And I think that's been very evident with when CWD was first identified and the cooperation that the DNR had with deer hunters here to allow access for, for sharpshooting, to provide samples, to work together. That's good. That's the first step in being absolutely successful in, uh, in solving your problem. There's a lot of other states that simply do not have that and did not have that and uh, would give anything to have it. So, uh, so you're starting from a good situation here. This is a picture of one of the first three deer that was identified with CWD uh, in Wisconsin uh, back in 2001. And, uh, and one of the things to note about this, and you know, we 
hunters across the Whitetails range that I talk to uh, literally work in 20 to 25 different states a year. And one of the things about hunters is that they are absolutely passive to this. They are naive to the severity of it, in large part because they don't want to believe it. And then they hear some saying, you know, that this is not a big deal, or it's a political disease, or it's a condition and not a disease. And obviously, you know, sitting here now that that's absolutely not true. This is a disease, and it is a really big deal. It's a big deal for anybody who has deer or has any part or a tie to deer. One of the things with this is hunters don't want to believe it and they don't see these sick animals. However, this animal here, you can see it has wasted away to almost nothing. This deer was killed in you know, the firearm season here in Wisconsin. But take a look at the antlers. Tremendous set of antlers on this. So this deer obviously was very healthy through the entire antler growing period. So March or April of 2001, all the way through September, this deer was very healthy. There's probably not a person in the state that would have seen it and identified it as a sick animal. As soon as it does start showing symptoms, though, then it obviously goes downhill very quickly, then everybody can identify it. However, how long did this deer have the disease before it showed those symptoms? We'll never know, but it likely was at least several months and probably a few years. Hence, part of the problem come in to convincing hunters about the severity of it, but it doesn't do anybody any good for us to dismiss the severity or talk about this not being a big deal. It clearly is a big deal, and it's a big deal for anybody who lives in a state that has CWD or has the potential to contract the disease. Well, uh, Brian Richards talked a little bit this morning about some of the ways that this is moving. I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper on this to show how this impacts hunters or how hunters can play into this and help the DNR with regard to uh, stopping this from getting into an area or maybe minimizing spread once it is in an area. Well, there's no doubt that movement uh, of an infected captive deer moves this around. This is not a shot at the captive deer industry by any means. It's just a stated fact. We know we have moved animals with a disease from facility to facility. Now, when they get there, it's not saying that they started in a facility and spread to the wild. You know, this is not an argument between their side and us at all. It's just we know that this is a way that they're being moved, and most likely the, the realistic way that animals with the, or the disease is moved across the landscape. If we take a look at this from my home state of Pennsylvania, this is a, these are known legal captive deer movements within Pennsylvania over a 10-year period. So... And I'm sure there were others that were not known or were not documented. This is from the Department of Ag, so known movements. This is a lot of movements. You know, and with regard to CWD or anything else, anytime you move a live animal, you know, everything else goes with that. Stuff that you may want to move, stuff that you may not want to move. So is it is a big deal moving live animals? It absolutely is a big deal. We talked a little bit yesterday about, you know, what if we could stop the movement of live animals? And I'm going to address that again once I get going on in here. But this is a huge issue and certainly one of the main ways that this disease has moved across the landscape. We also know that we move it across the landscape by infected uh, free-ranging animals that are moving. Lots of studies have shown that somewhere between half and three quarters of yearling bucks disperse one to five miles from their natal area. You know, are they moving the disease? They absolutely can be moving the disease. A much lower percentage of female deer disperse, but when they're in an area and move it, and when they move, just whether they move on a trail or they're walking, we are moving the disease from one area to another. We know that contact with the remains of an infected deer can, uh, can certainly transmit the disease, and this is where the carcasses come in. You know, when hunters leaving the high-risk parts in a certain area, the eyes, the spleen, the brain, the central nervous system, this is why states prohibit this movement. And there's been a big push over the last couple of years, well, certainly since Arkansas confirmed CWD, you know, most states would prohibit the movement of these carcasses into their state from states that they knew had CWD, or just parts of states that had CWD. Well, they identified CWD in Arkansas, and they started looking, and they realized, you know what? We've probably had it for at least 10 years in Arkansas. So suddenly now, anybody could have been moving carcass parts or deer in from there without knowing that. So you're starting to see some states like New York now, and others start to look at, you know what? We're just going to stop all movement of carcasses in from any state, whether it's been listed as CWD or not. And I think that's, that there's a lot of value to that, a lot of value. We've talked about the consumption of infected plants or soil. It's very clear now that, that plants can uh, uptake the prions. The actual mode of transmission or uh, the dose that's necessary to infect deer isn't as well known as this yet, but certainly it's something that's on the radar, as well as contact with other substances like the deer urine. Now, this is where uh, I think one of the real values of this meeting, you have some of the best minds in CWD and, and in deer managers, CWD science that we heard yesterday, and to your managers that you're going to hear later today with regard to this. But uh, I contend we have certainly asked hunters to do a lot in many instances, which I think we should. I'm, I'm a very conservative person by nature, and I think we need to take every step possible to minimize the spread of this disease. But I think there's a lot of hunters that are becoming tired of giving up something that they feel is very important to them or being a part of a program when, in many cases, we haven't shown success in what we're asking them to do. And I'll go further with that because I think the big issue is the two things we have here near the top, the movement of live deer 
and movement of those parts, we know has the potential to spread disease far more than urine or some of these other pieces. Yet we kick hunters all the time and ask them to give these things up in the name of being ultra conservative. However, I'll contend, you know, we can forget the stuff on the bottom. If we did the, the top things here on the top and stop moving live deer and stop moving carcass parts, we would be farther ahead, way, way farther ahead with regard to minimizing spread of this disease. And, uh, and I'll say this from the, from the movement end of it, I think it's all cervids, all live deer. I don't think we should be moving any deer among captive facilities. I don't think state wildlife agencies should be moving any deer. Sean just said that they're not moving whitetail deer now, but there are states that are moving mule deer. Utah moves a lot of mule deer every year. Wisconsin's still relocating elk from, from Kentucky. West Virginia is on the recent list of moving elk in. So, uh, you know, I think it's very difficult for a state wildlife agency to say to uh, hunters or captive, no, you can't do it, but we're going to do it. I think that sends a very confusing message to a lot of hunters. And in part, when they see that and they start losing faith in what some of our agencies are trying to tell them about the other stuff that we may know a little bit more about. So uh, probably made myself extremely unpopular with the deer farmers as well as many of the state wildlife agencies in here. But I think that of the things that we do know, there is no doubt that if we could stop live movement of all animals and we stop the high risk movement of those carcass parts, we would be farther ahead than what we have been in the last decade with this and give our scientists time for the research to catch up with things like a live animal test or some other things that we may be able to use to show more of a success in some of these CWD programs. And I'm certainly not faulting any of the state wildlife agencies with things that they have tried. And we have supported, we at QDMA have supported the vast majority of those programs in every instance. And, uh, and I think that we're far enough down that line now that we can take a look at some of those and say, you know what, can you show us any success stories from different pieces of this? And if the case is yes, this is the meeting that those need to be brought out so these folks can hear it and apply them in Michigan. If the answer is not, then maybe we can pull back and find some adaptive management strategies, something different that may work to keep hunters engaged in this process and being a very productive part of the solution to it. And I'll address that more as we get going. I'll show you this map here. This is a, the CWD Alliance map uh, with regard to, to where CWD is in uh, the 24 states in those three provinces. Uh, Ontario is not listed and uh, highlighted here, but it has been the Toronto Zoo, so it is listed as a province. And then this is different from the USGS map. And, uh, and this is not meant to show that, for instance, in Texas, that the entire state of Texas has had CWD or has identified it. It's more so to show, you know what, there's a lot of hunters who are impacted by CWD who live outside of those CWD zones. So Texas being an example, there's a lot of hunters in Texas who don't live near CWD that are being directly impacted by having that within their state. Hence the reason to show this, and we'll address this as we go. The impacts on hunters themselves, and I say in society here, and I think society is important, and I'm guessing everybody in here is, is a manager or is a hunter, but we often leave out the impacts to the society part, and I state that specifically because as hunters, and I will say this, I've been a wildlife biologist, a wildlife researcher for, for about the past 25 years now, and I have the best job in the world, but I am first and foremost a deer hunter. That's why I got into this, that's what I look at it from, and that's the folks that I enjoy helping with this. And as hunters, what percentage of the U.S. public hunts? Do we get to hunt because it's our God-given right? I wish we did, but that's not true. About 6% of the U.S. public buys a hunting license. And you all know very well, we don't get to do anything in this country because 6% of us say so. We get to hunt because the vast majority of the American public support hunting. It's nearly 80%. It's some of the highest public support uh, ratings we have ever had in the hunting world. And that public supports legal, ethical, regulated hunting. And the vast majority of that support comes for hunting when the meat is used or is consumed. If you look at trophy hunting approval ratings or anything else, they all fall off the table. We get to hunt because the public says we can and they say we can because they want us to eat that meat. So it is a huge issue now when there becomes a concern of we may not be able to consume venison from deer in these areas. All right, well, let's look at some of the things that actually happen once CWD arrives. One of the big things that we have tried in the past, many states have, QDMA has supported these, and I think every case is deer population reduction. We say, you know, let's take this, let's turn it into this, and drive deer herds, in many cases, below what the habitat can support to minimize contact among deer and help spread or minimize the spread of this disease. And if we take a look at this, you know, one of the things that, that comes back and always makes me laugh is that there's been folks in Colorado for a long time that have met with us and, and laughed. You know, these other states say, you know, well, we want to reduce deer to, to 30 deer per square mile. We can make some number up. And they'll laugh about it and say, you know what, they have got their hunters madder than, than a hornet's nest over trying to do this. They're losing support. They're losing a good cooperation. And you know what, here in Colorado, you know, we have areas where we have 10 deer per square mile that the disease is spreading. You know, what do they think they're going to do by reducing it to 30 
you know, in some other state. Not to say that a reduction is not the right thing to do, but I think that there's very few, maybe not any, examples where, yeah, an agency has been, first of all, successful at reducing deer herds to whatever level they're asking hunters to do, and then show that, yeah, we reduced the CWD prevalence because of it. And if there is examples of that, then I think this group absolutely needs to see them and needs to know about it as they discuss implementing those exact same things here in Michigan, because there's a lot of states that do not have that success story. You know, essentially, is the end of deer season as you know it once you get this disease. And as hunters, everybody knows you know, we're very ingrained with our values, ingrained in tradition. There are very few things that are more traditional to a person than how he or she grew up hunting. Whether it's a hunting camp uh, tradition, whether it's a dog hunting tradition, whether it's a travel to, or to another state and stay in a hotel, whatever that is, however you grew up, whether it's your father or your mother or your aunt or your uncle, whoever taught you how to hunt, that all that will stay with you for the rest of your life. And that's a very good thing. So anytime we change that, it impacts hunting. And that's why I have argued for years that there are so many better ways to, to manage deer within the confines of a season than to change the opening day. If you want to change the demographics of that harvest, you certainly can add more tags or reduce tags or reduce opportunity, whatever. But moving opening day often does the least to do that with regard to, to also keeping support from the hunters. Because a hunter will do, give up almost anything else or do anything else, but change opening day is extremely difficult. And in other cases, just very not productive. So when you have this now, it's the end of deer season as you know it, and suddenly that's a big change for hunters. And something that agencies have to work very closely with to be careful not to get, move them too far out of tradition, because you need their support and we need to work together on this. You end up with CWD check stations, you end up with headless deer. And if you've never done this, don't underestimate the, the difference of taking a deer home to, to mom and the kids that doesn't have a head on it. You know, and, and I remember the first time that I heard a CWD positive state researcher talk to me about this and I kind of laughed, like I never really thought about that. And now having experience and dealt with it, it's a big deal. It's very different to take a deer home to take pictures and show off one that has a head or one that does not have a head. You end up with movement regulations. Suddenly we can't move deer, and that's a good thing. You have to have this. But we need to understand that it's very different for hunters then. You often end up with longer hunting seasons, additional hunting seasons. We have sharpshooting now. So things that in many cases are very necessary, but the relationship between the agency and the hunters has to be such that the hunters understand the benefits to them for having this, and then so that they can be a productive part of this situation and, uh, and work with the agency. As I said when I started, I think that you're in a perfect situation in Michigan for this. The groundwork has been set because of the relationship the agency has developed with the hunters over the past decade to, to make this a, a much smoother transition for you as you go forward with things that you will need to, 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 to beat this. So, all right, lots of loss of privileges to hunters. You end up with no more feeding in many cases, no more baiting, no more using minerals, no urine attractants. and in these cases where we can show success, I think it would, the agency absolutely ought to be shouting this in the highest building to hunters, hey, we removed this and here's what we have seen, or this is what they did in another rate, and let's show you the success to understand why you can't do that anymore. And I will say this, I, I am not a feeder at all. I am not a fan of supplemental feeding. However, three weeks of the year, I do put corn on the ground at our place in Pennsylvania to conduct an annual camera survey. And I've done this for the last well, almost 15 years now. From that, I develop exactly what our target antlerless harvest will be for our property and for many of the co-op members in, the, in a 4,000 acre area around us. And it allows us to be very good stewards, in my opinion, of the natural resources there by not under or over harvesting does in those areas. That all comes from that camera survey. And I tell you, I cringe every year when they're waiting for the CWD results to come out of Pennsylvania because I know as soon as it is identified near my area, you know, I will lose the opportunity for us that will go out the window. So even though the, that I don't feed, I put all of my effort into enhancing habitat, you know, I really relish the opportunity to conduct uh, an annual camera survey to be able to get that information. I also don't believe that, uh, that I'm making my, the deer that use our farm any bigger by using minerals. However, it is a tremendous place to take pictures, to get others engaged with what's going on as these deer are attracted in. And so when you, you have CW, you lose this opportunity. And I will say this, of all of the things that states have done or prohibited with a CWDN, removing the baiting and feeding, in my opinion, is absolutely justified. We know for sure that from a saliva end, from a urine and feces end, when these animals are coming into these areas, that's absolutely a reservoir for, for transmitting disease. So uh, the urine, I think, is, is, is there's a lot of doubt with that and some of the other things that we do, but, but I think there's no doubt from a baiting and feeding end, and it's absolutely in our best interest to remove the opportunity for those. This is a big one for, uh, for, for a lot of hunters. 
Some agencies say we're going to remove antler restrictions and try to drive these deer herds to the age structure very young. So they're not encouraging exactly what hunters in many cases have been dying for and managing for for years. In many cases we're asked to go back to, to shooting yearling bucks. And I remember having a conversation uh, with the folks from Missouri when, uh, when they first identified it and their antler restrictions were so popular and they removed them. And, uh, and I said, you know what, you can remove them. Your hunters aren't going to go back to shooting yearling bucks. And, uh, and that deer biologist who actually sitting in this room at the time said, yeah, well, I agree with you. I don't think so either. And we were dead wrong. They went back and they were slamming yearling bucks. And they actually saw the same thing in Arkansas last year. So, so can you do it? You absolutely can drive that age structure younger. But here's my take on that. And this is where you start getting the separation or loss of support from a lot of hunters with this, is that you have a lot of hunters who want an opportunity to hunt something older than a yearling buck. And I'm not suggesting that you drive all these bucks to, to five years old by any means. You know, QDM and at its core just says, you know, protect yearlings, get them to at least two and a half years old. And I think hunters have shown that they clearly want that opportunity to hunt over deer. If you take a look around the U.S. right now for the last two years, of all the antler bucks that are shot, there are more antler bucks being shot today that are three and a half or older than those that are just one and a half years old. Think about how different that is from a decade or two decades ago. That's the reality today. Obviously, there's a lot of states that have antler restrictions. All those antler restrictions protect one age class, that yearling age class. So you have a lot of hunters who are talking the talk that they want older bucks, and they're walking the walk. They are passing all those two-year-olds to move them into a whole other age class. So that puts the agency at a difficult place where, you know what, we have hunters who are doing this. This clearly is what they want. Is this the end of the world from a disease end? Well, I'll say this if on paper, if you're managing the disease, it's very clear. Drive age structures very young, drive populations very low. And that's his age structures very young on both sides, bucks and does. And that works great on paper to battle a disease, but does that work in the real world? I'll contend it is not. But you need hunters to implement that plan. And hunters have increasingly shown an unwillingness to want to do that. This is against everything that they want. So here's where I fall in this. I think it is far more valuable for hunters to have the opportunity to hunt older deer as long as they do their duty and keep deer herds balanced with habitat, as long as they continue to harvest additional antlerless deer and not allow those, those deer herds to grow too high, I think that we're farther ahead having the opportunity to hunt some older bucks as well or as long as hunters are physically shooting antlerless deer. And actually, I think Michigan is a perfect example of that. If you can take a look around the state, antlerless harvests have been dropping, been dropping a bunch in the state. There's only one place in the entire state of Michigan where antlerless harvests are stable or even increasing, where they aren't dropping. And that's in the Northwest 12, where the hunters have their antler restrictions. And actually, a, a survey that the DNR did this past year showed that after four years of antler restrictions, they asked hunters, do you want to continue with these or not? And, uh, and they got 77% support by hunters to continue antler restrictions. Now, I'll contend there's not a single person in here who can go back to your state and survey your deer hunters and ask them if deer are brown. You would not get 77% of the hunters would agree that deer are brown. Deer hunters don't agree on anything at that high of a level. But then that area, they like that so much, an opportunity that they are harvesting analyst deer at a higher rate than any place else in the entire state of Michigan. And I will commend and applaud the DNR this year, earlier this year in the TB zone for trying something different. Hey, you know what? They proposed applying antler restrictions in that TB zone to allow hunters to refocus that effort to analyst deer to drive those deer herds lower. It didn't pass the, the NRC commission, but you know what? Good for the DNR for trying something different, you know, and getting hunters really supportive and engaged in something. I think that's tremendous. That's something that's not been tried anywhere else. And I think it is time that we do start trying different things like that. So I think that, that, was, that was good. All right, well, let's talk about some of the, the license money, some additional impacts that, that, that happen once CWD is there. Uh, it's diverted from herd and habitat management into CWD sampling, into CWD monitoring, surveillance. These are all very necessary things. This has to happen. This is just showing you a reality of what happens there. This is a little example that we did back in 2005. At that time, all of these states did not have CWD. Since then, Pennsylvania and Maryland have identified it, but New York did. So we did this little exam or exercise to show the cost to these agencies once you had it. So none of these states did. They sampled in total just under 6,000 deer, and it cost them somewhere between 60 and $180,000 for that. Neighboring New York, who did have CWD, because they had to sample the intensity of it and figure out exactly where it is, which, good for them, that was a very necessary thing, alone had to sample more deer than all of these other states at a much higher cost. So, you know, the costs of CWD are very real. They're very real to the agencies. Wisconsin has now spent over $49 million on CWD, monitoring, surveillance, management, et cetera. So just stop and think for a second. If instead of having the disease and having to spend that money on it, what if Wisconsin the DNR could have spent $49 million on hunter access, land management, habitat enhancement, land purchases? How awesome would that have been? 
And I'm not chastising the Wisconsin DNR at all. Thank God they did have this money and spend it on them, chose to, to do that. They had to do that. But just think for a second, if they didn't have to, how much further we could have been ahead with a lot of hunting programs. We also end up with tax dollars that are diverted to deer farmers. And I know everybody who's a deer farmer in here now is going to get real uncomfortable and probably be really mad at me. And I'm not chastising deer farmers at all. This is where hunters see this as well and, and become upset by this. So I think that we ought to have a discussion about it and just lay it on the table where it is. This is part of our farm bill, our current farm bill, the 2000 bill. Um, it's with part of the uh, indemnification program. Sean alluded to it a little bit. Um, in 2014, an Iowa deer farm was confirmed CWD positive. I heard was euthanizing over 79% of those deer were CWD positive. So, you know, are they moving the disease from in that fence, outside the fence? I'm not here to argue that. Is there a chance of that? There absolutely is a chance of that. Just as if it's in the area, there's a chance a deer on the outside can move it in. You know, I'm not battling one way or the other, but that farmer was paid almost a million dollars for that deer. Hunters see this. Hunters understand that this is, hey, this is taxpayer money that came from it. So is this a good thing? No, well, I will say this. I think that an indemnification is a two-edged sword. You know, certainly there's money that's paid to this that hunters are just irate about. The flip side of it is, you know, would it be better to just take those fences down, not pay the farmer and let the deer go? No, probably not. It's probably a lot better. At least those deer were euthanized in there. So, but you know, whichever side of the fence you may be on this, it's, it's a very real fact that goes with it that certainly the, the industry is aware of, but, but hunters are aware of too, as they should be. All right. Certainly honey participation rates can decline. We'll use some data from Wisconsin. This was the last season they had, the licenses they sold prior to, to, to confirming CWD. The next year, license sales dropped to this. They did recover a little bit after that, but at least through then, uh, through 2011, you're the, the program here doesn't like, I guess, my, there we go, uh, my version of PowerPoint. It never did recover to, to where it was prior to that. And we know that hunting license sales are declining in just about every state across the whitetails range. This is not new. I show you this to say that once this does decline and happens in hunting participation, few people is not good for the future of wildlife. It leads to less money for wildlife and it leads to fewer advocates for hunting. And that's never a good thing. I started by saying only 6% of us buy a hunting license. We don't need to go less of us. We need more. We also know that it has economic repercussions in an area. Um, in Missouri, we work with some folks there that are in the recreational uh, land business. And we know that there is no way to decontaminate a site once it does have CWD. Land values in decline. And uh, in Missouri, when it first was identified, within six months after that, land values dropped by two to $400 an acre. Um, you know, people were not wanting to buy land in an area that had been confirmed CWD positive from, from a hunting end, and largely from the, the unknown. You know, of all the things we do know, there's still so much we don't know that they were nervous for it. So uh, this impacts far more than just the hunting end. Outside of, the, I guess, the possible exception uh, of the state of New York, nobody has won the CWD battle. So we know the prions remain in the soil for years. We heard that yesterday. Uh, the disease continues to spread through deer herds. Um, and there was really no suggestion in, in the near future that we're going to be able to do anything to stop that or decontaminate these areas. Um, you saw one of these graphs earlier. I'm going to show you three of them here real quick. I think the Wisconsin DNR does a tremendous job compiling this data and making it available uh, to hunters on the website showing, you know, in South Central Iowa County back in 2002 when they first confirmed it, about 1% of the adult bucks had the disease. And if you look today, it's over 30%. We can take a look at another county, Richland County, 35%. Iowa County, over 40%. I show these purposely not to say this is exactly the prevalence or any of that, just to show you, does this look like it's slowing down anytime soon? Is there any hint looking at this to suggest that, you know what, in the near future, this is going to go the other way? Not at all. Not at all. I think there's a lot of hunters that hear some say, you know what, this is not something to worry about. We haven't seen population declines. You've seen the results this morning. That's not true at all. We are seeing population declines, documented research population declines in areas that have had it for longer than they've had it in Wisconsin. How close are we to that tipping point in Wisconsin? Uh, Dr. Samus said yesterday, you know, what is it, 20 to 25 percent prevalence in does before you start seeing it? A few years ago, I did a, a, a survey of numerous state wildlife agencies' population models, and the majority suggested that somewhere harvesting between 20 and 30 percent of the adult does in any given year will stabilize those deer herds. Harvest more than that, and those populations decline. And many of those models were developed, and we had fawn recruitment rates much higher than we have today. So if you get anywhere near that, it would I'd say it's plausible to suggest today that probably closer in many states to that 20 percent Harvest of female deer on an annual basis can stabilize a herd. So it takes far fewer female deer dying to start reducing deer herds. And with what we see here, I contend that we are very close to that tipping point in Wisconsin. 
Wisconsin was the first state east of the Mississippi River to get it. A lot of other states came in after that. So uh, are we going to continue to see an increased declines from this? I say there's absolutely we are. I don't think there's any way you could suggest otherwise based on what the prevalence rate in these graphs are. All right, so what are the implications for hunters? Well, certainly fewer mature bucks, which really is the impetus for, for many to be involved today and to continue to hunt. You can take a look at annual harvest rates along many states, and it's not nearly as many deer as the bag limit is. So to keep people engaged in harvesting animalless deer, because that's really where everything goes awry. If we stop harvesting animalless deer and stop balancing deer herds, then uh, we don't have a chance in heck of fighting this disease. So people have, hunters have got to stay engaged. In many cases, it's the buck side that makes that, that plausible or makes it happen for them. Lower deer densities, I think you're absolutely going to be. And fewer disease-free deer, and this is a big one. Because is it safe to eat? Well, we know that it's not. You know, everybody contends, you know, do not eat that. The World Health Organization Centers for Disease Control make it very clear. If it's CWD positive, don't eat it. However, how many people eat deer that it's from an area that they didn't know that it had the disease? Or as Dr. Fisher talked yesterday, it's not a food safety test. You know, is there a lot of this being eaten? There absolutely is likely a lot of CWD positive deer being eaten. And I will tell you this, I am the first one that my wife will say, I don't take nearly enough caution in my life. I don't wash my hands enough. I eat meat when it's been left out of the refrigerator way, way too long. But I tell you this, I'm not going to eat CWD positive deer, and I darn sure I'm not going to feed it to my kids. Would you feed it to your little boy or your little girl or that family down the street or to your church? You know, how many of you donate venison? I bet you almost every hunter in here donates venison. We did a survey earlier this year of QDMA members. QDMA members donated last year alone over 3.4 million venison meals in 2016 alone. You know, so how many of those ended up from an area that had, may have had the disease you know, and went to a church or a food group or something? We don't know. It's a big deal, a really big deal. How those of you that garden in CWD endemic areas? How many of you see deer in your garden? Heck yeah, they're in there. They're eating your plants. But what else are they doing there? They're urinating there. They're defecating there. And we know now that those prions can be I'm taking those plants. So are you eating that? You know, those nice heads of lettuce that you grow? Probably. Probably are something to certainly consider. All right, current status then. There is much concern about the increased spread of CWD. And I don't think there's any doubt about that. 99% of the people working on this issue would tell you this is one of the biggest issues impacting deer management and the future of deer hunting in the United States. We have new states. We have new areas within states. And because of that, there's much concern about the future of wildlife. Certainly from a deer herd end and the deer hunting end, but because of the impact that deer hunting has on all of our wildlife management programs, all of our wildlife out there are at stake because of this disease. So is it at the end of deer hunting? I'll say absolutely not, at least not yet. And I have a lot of faith in the people sitting in this room and across our state wildlife agencies to make it so that it's not. But we absolutely must be vigilant to, to minimize any new transmission of the disease into new areas, certainly into new states. We need to prevent uh, introduction of it in these new areas, and we certainly need to support our state wildlife agencies and our universities' efforts on this. We heard yesterday some of the work that has been done and how much it still needs to be done. Of all the stuff we do know about it, there's a whole lot more that we don't know. And I think a lot of those research needs were identified yesterday, and I'm guessing there'll be more discussion this afternoon with them. So and I think that's a good thing. I think it's very important for people to know what we don't know about it. Therefore, then how we can take what we do know and apply it in, in a very productive manner. So we do have a, a recommended practices for hunters in CWD zones on our website. And I'll say I share this because I, I'm very proud of how this was put together. Our members here in Michigan actually asked for this. This was done with the work of, of Brian Richards and USGS with the Michigan DNR and others taking a look at kind of, all right, what do we know about this? And how should hunters who live in these zones, what should they do? You know, from a herd management end, from a habitat management, should you plant food plots or not? If you do, should you plant stuff that has root crops? You know, where deer like the multiple deer can take bites off the same one. There's a lot of good stuff that went into this, as well as the difference between hemorrhagic disease and CWD. Huge differences. Huge, huge differences. But there's a lot of hunters that still confuse the two and really don't know exactly how they fit in. So uh, from, from an educational standpoint, these are both available at our website. You know, we see it as our obligation to be able to get good information out. And, and we think that the partnerships that we have with the agencies, with the researchers and the universities to be able to provide information that we then can get out to hunters in mass to help them be certainly better educated about the subject, but also be tremendous partners within whatever state they may be to work with the agency. Because uh, without hunters and agencies and researchers working together, this is not going to get better for anybody. So with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations today.